Greetings in the Lord Jesus. It's, it's been a heck of a week, but I've looked forward to this. I Every week I look forward to speak with you, and I really do consider you my family and, and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is family time, and probably today is more about you than it has been any other time, and I'll explain that, but let me welcome in our wisdom warriors that I love so much, our sage warriors and intercessors throughout the nation and so many other countries that we, we never uh, expected that. It's just, it's, it's a blessing beyond what we could have thought. We get prayer requests from all over the world. And let me say this, I'll start off and this is like me coming to the living room or wherever you're at. We're sitting in the backyard just talking. Uh, that's this family. And I'm going to try to stick close to my notes and I'll give you an idea of, of today. A word of encouragement from my friend. You know, the Lord taught me over the years is the same way I, I try to teach you. He shows me you call them visions or, but he shows me pictures. He shows me examples in that happened in the word. Uh, he shows me from nature. He shows me, he teaches me by pictures and by visions, the word of God, his word. He always takes me back to the word. And then from there, he gives me assignments to, to study. And you've seen that over the years. And, my Bereans are the same way. I, I love you and I appreciate you. I was on a previous broadcast years ago and we were talking offline and this person, he asked me, he said, well, Jim, where does the Lord talk to you? He seems to, to talk to you a lot. And I said, you know, my private time for sure, but strange enough, this was David. I said, strange enough, he, he, he has this thing about talking to me in the shower. And he got all excited. He goes, somebody, he, he speaks to me in the shower. And I remember uh, we were doing a prayer a I, I believe, in the, three or four years ago. And one of the ladies, she said, we we're talking off camera. And she said, that's the same thing with me. And I, I believe we uh, talked about it once the camera came on. And uh, just earlier when I was preparing, I was in the shower. And I was <laughs> telling the Lord, I said, I speak to him all, all, all the time. I say, it's been like a rock pushing uphill. He says, no, I'm the rock pushing you uphill. <laughs> and I thought, and I told Kimberly, I said, he, you know, what is he said? Yeah. And I said, that's the way he is. He just, he has a sense of humor. He's, he's, he's God. He's fully God. I, I, I love, I respect, admire, worship. But he's also my best friend, and he talks to me uh, the way that I can understand. So I was telling him, it's been tough. And he said, I'm the rock pushing you uphill. But in what's happened since we've moved here, uh, this last broadcast on Thursday, uh, when we saw it play back and the words are backwards, I just, I wept. I, I, I didn't sleep that night. I, the next morning I was immediately going to get up and just pull it down. And so, I don't know, 536, which is normally when I'm sound asleep, because I usually get to sleep at two or three in the morning. Um, he said, I don't want you to take it down. I want it to be just like it is. And I said, why is that, Lord? He says, first, why is it upsetting you? He knows the answer before he ever asked me anything. And I'm sharing this with you as I've never wanted to share my personal life with him because I don't want it to be about me. I never wanted the attention to myself, but it, it more and more asked me, please just share stuff because it encourages us that we want that relationship. And I assure you, he wants the same thing with you. I'm, I'm not special. I'm not different. I've sought him for a long time and He said, what has you so upset? I said, Lord, 
when I get in front of the family or I teach them, I represent you, and it just it breaks my heart that I did I didn't do an honor of you. You know, that it was just it, it, it breaks my heart that I want to do my best to represent you. And he said, if all my teachers and all those that taught thought the same way, he said, I'm very pleased with you. And I'm not saying that to brag on myself, but he was encouraged me. I said, Lord, but it's been just one thing after another. It's like a disaster. Um, I didn't have my credenza in for three weeks. I used different backgrounds. And you know that for three years it was, we had all the issues worked out and I started off in my little pictures. I used a, a few nights. I said, Lord, maybe I just need to go back to my little printed pictures. It seems so complicated. But he said, this, this last month has been about the family. He said, you have pushed forward. You have moved on. You have done everything each and every time to try and present the best that you know how. And you always have highlighted me and my word. And that has honored me. He said, but this is about the, the family. I said, well, how is that? He said, there have been many, many in the family that have reached out to you and have encouraged you and have said, don't worry about, you'll get it all. We understand moving. You'll get everything right. We appreciate the word. We listened to the message and the message was what I needed to hear. We wanted to hear or it was from scripture. This is about the family outpouring of love to you to Kimberly during this process and to Luke. And, you know, that causes me even more to, I said, Lord, I, I just didn't want to disappoint you and I don't want them to see a quality that's less than what you deserve. And he said, it's your heart and their heart that I'm after. And so he asked me to share that with you. And um, for those that stop watching or couldn't listen, that's your choice. And I'm not, all I'm saying is the ones that have watched and encouraged us, the Lord says, this was about you. And you're looking for the word, you're listening for the word, and the words weren't right, the background, but uh, my heart is toward the Lord, and I have, and I will always be, as we talk about at night with Luke, is that I have to be the same person with him and with Kimberly here at home where no one else sees as I am on camera or when I go out. And thankfully, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm the same person. Probably boring, but I'm the same person. So let's see how today is. Today is a special message about him. We, we're going to have communion, but... I'm going to wait until next week so that my bride can join us and so that Luke can join us. I will say this about Kimberly, um, your prayers. And she said she feels your prayers. Your prayers and the touch of the Lord has been amazing. The healing process after major surgery uh, has been more than can be expected. She went back to her doctor on Tuesday, I believe, and the doctor was shocked. She said, I, I, I cannot believe that you're uh, a, you know, mobile walking and the pain is not anywhere near it is with others. Uh, and I expected pain and stuff to go on much longer. And uh, Kimberly said, well, we've had a lot of people praying for me. She said, but also I think the, the, intercessors had prayed probably more for you than they did for me and it really uh, touched the doctor uh, don't know if she's a believer or not she's brand new I mean we didn't even didn't know who she was Kimberly had never met her before her surgery and we had to pick new OBGYN and all those things when we moved here so it's been a battle but as the Lord said he's a rock pushing us so we thank his grace, his mercy, but we are so indebted and, and appreciate you. We, we 
are very thankful during this time of year. Prayer requests have continued, and thank you for those that have been faithful that continue to give during this time, even with all the craziness of trying to get this right. And today is not right, but I, I hope and pray is better than it was last week, and we'll improve it. But the Lord said, I'm aware of everything that's going on, and I'm aware of the reaction of the family. So let's see how we do. Today is about friendship. He is my best friend. I started years ago, and I've studied the word for almost 50 years. When I started years ago, I never asked about thrones and angels and those things. I, I was always asking about, um, how are you as a person? Uh, <laughs> I think of in myself, God in diapers. Uh, Mary having to change uh, his diapers, um, feeding him, and like we did, or any mother, you know, they had to walk and, and burp the baby, and uh, how they crawl, and when were the first few steps. I would visualize those things, and I would ask the Lord in those days about those things, about his life and about how he was as, as, a, as a, a child, a teenager, and growing up, and as I've said, what was his favorite food that Mary would make? What was his favorite project he ever made with his uh, stepfather, uh, Joseph, or once he was on his own as a carpenter? Uh, what were some of the things he made? I asked the things a best friend would know about a best friend. Um, what does he like? Uh, does he have a sense of humor? And believe me, he's <laughs> he's kind of a prankster to me, but I call him Jehovah Sneaky. He has a sense of humor. All I can say is I know that's my relationship with him. He doesn't tell me, uh, buddy, I need you, and the whole world depends on a relationship. That's, I've heard that from others, and that's not my relationship with the Lord. My relationship with him, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of a quandary, Lord, because you're my best friend, and Kimberly's my best friend, and I don't know, a few months ago, he said, I'm your best male friend, and she's your best female friend. <laughs> I said, I'm good with that. If the Son of God is good with that. So he's been my friend, and he comes and talks and teaches, and um, that's not a reflection on me. It's not like I'm some spiritual giant. I'm just a simple former Marine that's a Cajun that that's about it. I love him and by him and by the Holy Spirit, he's touched my heart, pulled me out of one cave and I'm in another to reach out and to, he, he's put a family around us and more joining. So friendship, but let me, people ask me about the National War Council and what's the address. I'm gonna say this, if you really wanted to know our address, you can go back and look at other tapes uh, don't write, please, anymore. What is that address again? Either go back to the tapes or write it down. Um, if you want to give, give. If you don't, don't. There's no, uh, we never try to emotional and all that other stuff. The Lord brings those and he lays on the heart of those that are supporting this ministry. He blesses them in different ways. It's not, if you give, Ten dollars, you're going to get a hundred dollars back, and all those other things. That that's not what this is about. But it takes your support to be able to do all that we're doing. I spend, as you know, probably. I thought you know you'd retire, probably sixty hours a, a week in preparing and pictures and praying and not only praying over the requests that come in, but it's not a job. We none of us have a salary. It's three of it. It's four. If you, Kimberly, uh, myself, and Luke, people say, "How is your staff doing?" We don't have a staff. Greg is my brother in the Lord that the Lord brought to us, and he takes care of the uh, website that, and at the time with the membership, and we'll adjust to that and start posting things on it. But for a while, I just took a break on it, but. Greg is phenomenal. He has his own work that he does, and he does this when he does just on a part-time basis. But 
none of us are on salary and, and all those things. So we look to the Lord and the Lord moves on who he wants to. And that's kind of the way it is. We don't look to any individuals, but everyone, regardless of what you give, you will receive a note back from Kimberly thanking you because that's what we wanted when we were givers that just anonymously even acknowledged that we thank you that you gave. And there were many that they never thanked us, but they would always send us an envelope to send something else. So friendship. So let's, um, so that's the National War Council. For those listening by radio, post office box 35915. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74153. I think we've been here, oh, maybe a month now. And it seems sometimes like a day or two, and others it seems like it's been years. So the Apostle Paul, okay? So I'm going to talk about friendship, and then we're going to move into some other areas. The Apostle Paul. This is the desire in my heart, and this is what the Apostle Paul has said. Christ crucified. I hope it comes out the right way. I tested it, but if it doesn't, I read these to you. The only reason I post them is so that you can see the scriptures. Uh, I try not to make my teachings about pictures, but pictures help show uh, people. It shows places, examples. But I never want to replace my teaching scripture with you concentrating so much on pictures. And that was one of the other things he said. I don't want them to be looking at pictures. I want them to be concentrating on the word of God, my word, and on the teaching itself, not what picture looks good, what picture doesn't look good. So 1 Corinthians 2, 2 through 5. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse three, and I was with you in weakness, I identify that, and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of powers, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that has to do with my teachings. I come not in myself, not in my own power, but like the Apostle Paul, and that's why prophets probably, we have very few friends, is because what I want to know and what I, my life is about is Christ crucified. My Savior, my Lord, laid down willing his life for you and for me and for the loved ones in our family, and that is the beat of my heart. And so all these other conversations of trivial things, uh, they don't interest me. But Paul, he said, that's what I want to know and teach and let you know that it's in my weakness and fear of trembling. Paul had an eye uh, disease, and, and many, I believe, it came from when the Lord appeared to him and he had the scales on his eyes, but that's another teaching. A lot of scriptures, I'm going to read them, but I will never steer away from giving you a lot of scriptures. Ephesians 3, 7 through 21. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am (laughs) people knocking on the door, there's all around us. Uh, To me, though, I am the very least of all saints. This grace was given to me to preach the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring the light for everyone. What is the plan of the mystery hidden in ages in God who created all things? so that through the church, the ecclesia, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Do you realize that you, your spouse, your loved ones that are in Christ, we are a mystery to principalities and powers, those that remain in righteous positions and those that 
are in evil positions, principalities and powers. What the ecclesia is, is a mystery. It was hidden in the Old Testament and it was given Paul to be revealed in the New Testament. Hidden in the Old Testament from the saints, the prophets, but revealed in the New Testament called the ecclesia. That's why I teach on there was the Old Testament saints, the Jewish, there are the New Testament, which is the Ecclesia, and then there will be tribulation saints. Verse 10 again. So that through the Ecclesia, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he, at God, has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, and whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Verse 13. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. Verse 17. So that Christ may, be, may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, our brothers and sisters, what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. My message always to you is how precious and how much he loves you. The compassion, the mercy, every time he speaks to me about you, it is in compassion, in mercy, and him pouring love forth. Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That's my desire for you. Now to whom, to him, Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, power of the Holy Spirit, to him be glory in the church, the ecclesia, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So when you look at that, what is the purpose of our family when we gather together, either considered as a church, considered as a Bible study, but we are a family that gathers through a podcast on different platforms to honor, to praise the Lord Jesus Christ, to encourage each other in the scriptures and in the word of God. Okay. As we read quoting the apostle Paul in first Corinthians two, he was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He resolved himself before he preached among the Corinthians that this should be the only point of knowledge that he would profess himself to be skilled in. And that in the course of his ministry, he would labor to bring them the knowledge and understanding of the mystery. There it is, the mystery of Christ cruci crucified, buried, resurrected, and living forevermore. That's the gospel of Christ. You know, you can go on and on, but what is the gospel according to the word and according to what Paul said, Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, and living forevermore. And we are eternal beings that will live with him forevermore. Expressed in Ephesus and Philippi, he expressed the breadth, there is again, the length, depth, and height of his knowledge regarding Christ. Yea, doubtless, Paul stated, and I count all things for loss, for excellency of knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And that's my heart, and that's the heart of this family and our ministry, and I pray that it be your heart. Ephesians 3.18 and Philippians 3.8. Okay? Where I'm at on my pages. <laughs> Joseph Scriven. I'm going to give you an example of a few people as we move through. I'm going to take my time. Uh, if you need to, stop the tape, watch it some more, or watch it two or three times. But 
hurrying through, that's the other thing. He said, I never hurried. Uh, when he was on the mound, they were so hungry, they'd listen to him for hours and hours. Uh, he broke bread and fed thousands several times. They wouldn't leave. They wanted to hear the word. So Joseph Scriven in 1855 wrote, What a friend we have in Jesus. I know that as I uh, grew up and went to Florida Boulevard Baptist Church under Roy Stockstill, that's one of the songs that I remember from years ago. But listen to his life. Joseph Scriven was born in 1819 of prosperous parents in Bainbridge, Ireland. He graduated a degree from Trinity College in Dublin in 1842. Here we go. Now remember, this is the man that you'll see. What a friend we have in Jesus. His fiance accidentally drowned in 1843, the night before they were to be married. Okay. I'll read it from here. In 1844, at the age of 25, Scriven left his native country and migrated to Canada, settling in Woodstock, Ontario. You can see it on the screen. In 1855, he received news from Ireland of his mother being terribly ill. He wrote a poem to comfort his mother called, Pray Without Ceasing. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, a prophet, yes, but my calling I know was always intercessor. And I intercede and pray because that's just uh, the, the gift that I know that I have. Pray without ceasing was a, the poem he wrote. It was later set to music and renamed by Charles Kozer, Converse, becoming the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. About 1857, he moved near to Port Hope, Ontario, where he again fell in love and was due to be married. But in August, 1860, his fiance fell ill with pneumonia and died. He then devoted the rest of his life to tutoring, preaching and helping others. Scriven drowned in 1886 at age 66. At the time of his death, excuse me, he was very ill with fever and had been brought down to a friend's home to recover. There are trials and tribulations you go through in this life. How you face them and uh, your heart and determination is important. Thankfully, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. But there are times we get frustrated, we lose hope, and yet he understands that. So I'm sharing about one individual. He went through a lot of things, and yet there's a song that I sang when I was younger that he had written as a poem. So he went to his friend's house to recover. It was a very hot night, and he may have possibly gone down uh, outside to cool down or to get a drink of cold water from the spring. His friend reported, we left him about midnight. I withdrew to an adjoining room to watch and pray. You may imagine my surprise and dismay when, upon visiting his room, I discovered <laughs> uh, he wasn't in there. It was empty. All search failed to find a trace of the missing man, my brother, until a little after noon, his body was discovered in the nearby river, lifeless and cold and deaf. He was buried next to his second fiance in her family cemetery, Neil Bedley. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? That word friend. We're going to talk about friends today, friendship. Some of you that may know those hymns, probably some of my wisdom warriors, I'm there with you. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, I started losing it. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to, I take it to my best friend. It happens to be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, but also the Son of Mary that I've read these accounts where he was a 
bad Dennis the Menace and all that. No, he wasn't. Um, I have shared in the past uh, when I asked him, I said, how, how early did you know that you were the son of God? And I shared Psalms 22 and says, pull my mother's breast. So he knew throughout his life at age 12, when they were looking for him, he stayed back at the temple. Yeah, parents looked for him for three days. And when they found him, he said, where do you expect to find me? I'm in my father's house. He was not a bad child. He did. He has shared a lot of things with me about his childhood even about his food and some of those things. He never has told me about his project. Like, was there ever a, really a good one or one you wish you could do over? So this past week, after my time of that Friday night, so he came to me, right? Every night. Some nights he knows I'm exhausted and I know he's there, but so he had a question. This question leads into part of the teaching today, but this was actually for you. In my private time, he always asked me a question. He already knows the answer, but he always asked me a question or come here. I want to show you something and we'll go see something. Did you come or did I call? I want you to ask yourself that. So Jesus shows up to you and says, did you come or did I call? It To me, it, it was like, I wonder why he's asking me that. You know, you know, he knew that. And I'm going to give you what he shared with me, and then we'll get into the other part, okay? Did you come or did I call? There are many people that said, well, I came to Jesus, or it was all on my part, and say, okay. So look at John 1, 35 through 42, okay? The next day, John was standing, this is uh, John the Baptist, was standing with two of the disciples. And for those listening on radio, John 1, 35 through 42, yeah, verse 36. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God, verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus, Okay. On their own, John had been talking to them about, this is the Lamb of God, this is the Son of God, and they were there also when the Holy Spirit came upon him like, like a dove and rested upon him. And it says in verse 37, so these two followed Jesus, right? Verse 38 says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, uh, what are you seeking? <laughs> King James, or in my, why are you following me? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Remember, Mary addressed him as Rabboni, teacher, when she saw him in the garden. Uh, where are you staying? <laughs> it's a funny question there. Like, uh, where do you live? Uh, where are you staying? You're walking down the road. Where are you going? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. Remember, he, he said at one time, foxes have holes, but I don't have a home. Right? And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour, verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, right? Simon, Peter's brother. You remember Andrew was on Mount Olivet when they had that private Olivet discourse. It was Andrew and Peter, James, and John, the first time, the private briefing. And so, verse 41, he found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, it means the Christ, the anointed one. And he knew what that would mean. Verse 42, he brought in with Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And you know, when he says upon this rock, that's rock, I will build, you know, talking about Jesus is a rock. Peter is a rock. But on this truth that Peter had found that he is the son of God, I will build my ecclesia. So Peter was a rock, but he was not the first pope of the, of the church. Uh, he was never a bishop in, in, in uh, Jerusalem either, or in Rome. So the point of that, what? They followed him, right? So they made an effort to follow him. And there are many people that say, you know, it, it's kind of like I had the initiative. I went to church. Uh, I, list, I, I did these things. I, I, I was seeking. And so, okay. 
And that's all legitimate. So is this. So I wanted to show you what he was telling me, though. So John 15, 14 through 17. You are my friends, right? Here we go with the friends. If you do what I command you, if you're following my word, commandments sound laborious and hard. If you follow the words and the lifestyle of Christ and want to be like him, he says, you're my friend, okay? Don't make it legalistic and more complicated than it is. He said, if you hear my words and you want to be like me and you want to live a, a more honorable life, I consider you my friend. So when I say to you, my best friend and he is my friend, that is scripture. Don't say, oh, you know, you're trying to make yourself spiritual. I am not, but he is my friend. Okay. So verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, right? For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I've heard from my father I have made known to you. Servant, when a rabbi, a rabboni, had disciples with him, they were more like almost in a servitude to him. Uh, honored him, respected him, provided for him, uh, fed him, all those types of things. He says, you're, 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 that's not the way this is working. You're my friends, but here's the key aspect of it. Remember, we saw they followed him, but here's the key aspect. He says, I've shared everything my father, my dad has shared with me. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father, our dad, our father, in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. People said, I can't believe you call God the father, your dad. Abba, father, dear father. It, that, if that's not for you, that's okay. For me, it didn't. <laughs> Like, I can't imagine me calling God because I came from a Baptist, Baptist legalistic background and it was rigid and you addressed, you, you, you're never saying to him, you're saying about him. And those are years past. Uh, he's my father. Uh, it's like uh, the prodigal. He waited every day and prayed and, and, and longed for him. When the son returned, he ran out and met him. And wept, and the son starts telling him, I'm no longer worthy to be. And he says, shh, 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 shh. No, stop all that. You're my son. You have always been my son. You will always be my son. We're going to clean you up and put the signet ring back on you and go kill the fatted calf. But the point on this is whether you made an effort, and I did to go to church, and I was raised in church, and it just came, it was always him. It was always him calling and choosing you, okay? Always, and I'll show it to you. So what does the word friends, right? What is the word friends? It's the Greek 5384, okay? See where I'm on my slides. 5384. He who associates familiarly with one, you see that's a tongue tire for me, so say it's, it's somebody you're close to. A companion, also in the Jewish custom, I always take you back to the Jewish custom, of the bridegroom's friend who on his behalf asked the hand of the bride and rendered him numerous services in closing the marriage and celebrating the, the nuptials. <laughs> okay, that's from Alfred Eldershine, published in 1862, the Jewish Social Life, page 152. I do a lot of reading. <laughs> Boring for most people, but I love the customs and the background uh, of, of the Jewish customs. So you remember Abraham sent out uh, his servant to find a bride for Isaac. Well, Jesus, you know, think of that. Who is going out for his bride? For you and I. Think about it, right? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has drawn us to Christ. No man cometh unto the Father, but the Spirit draw him. Okay? But in this instance, the word friends that he is using is the Greek 5384. 
Okay. I call you friends. I call you friends. So these people that are legalistic and you can, you know, uh, and he is king. He is the Jewish high priest. He is Lord. He is king of kings and Lord of lords. He is everything. He is majesty. He is the throne in, in heaven is just a whole different. And I tell him, and I, I've been to heaven several times. I can't grasp it. Not only can I, can I grasp it, there's nothing that I can put in words to say it's like this because it, 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 it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't really describe it very well. But friends, I'm showing this to you so we can break down some of the legalism and to say you really can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's not your buddy to try to go hang out with and, and that's not what I'm talking about. He's not someone to try to manipulate. He's not someone to try, none of that stuff. I'm talking about the highest respect and regard for a friend. It's, I did not have this, but there are many that have an older brother or an older sister that you are very close with all of your life and your older brother or your older sister you love with all your heart and you can go to them with anything because you have that relationship and there is a respect but it's still a brother it's a your older brother or your older sister is also probably a good your best friend maybe that's the way he is but nobody to take for granted, nobody to try to manipulate. He knows everything already. Before you think it, he knows it. So all the, not sometimes, all the time when he asks me a question, he already knows the answer. It's not for him, it's for me. It's not only for me, I've learned, but it's for those that listen. Uh, <laughs> there is a roaring lion that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. They're amazed at his grace and mercy, okay? So let me go to my pictures. <laughs> so when did this start? Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. This lesson today is for you. <laughs> it's about you. Ephesians 1, 3, 3 through 6. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ in the Messiah, with every spiritual blessing, where at? In the heavenly places. I'd like to teach on that, that we live and move and have our being in Christ. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. It's a whole, very few understand it. It's a different teaching, but it's a good one. Blessing in heavenly places. Remember the principalities, power, spiritual wicked in the heavenly realm? We have a realm above that. Verse 4, even as he, chose us in him when when did he choose you when you went to church and when you started seeking god even as he chose us in him in jesus christ before the foundation of the world when was christ crucified before the foundation of the world when did he choose you before the foundation of the world verse four for those listening even as he chose us put your name in there mary jim joseph mark sally Kelly, Kimberly, Luke. <laughs> Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we, that you, should be holy and blameless before him. That's what he did for you, for you, for me, for the scholar, for my beautiful bride. What? Holy and blameless before him because of our works? No, because of his work on the cross. Because his blood, there is nothing, no gold, no silver, no, there's, there's not, not Michael, not Lucifer before his fall. There was nothing, only the blood of God. What do you mean blood of God? Fully man, fully God. The seed war that began in Genesis 3.15 and said, his seed will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel, right? What seed is that? The seed of the Father. Mary had an egg. The seed of the Father. Where? And the blood comes from? Okay, that's another one. But those in medical and biology understand. 
he predestined us, so if he called you before, he knows ahead of time. Doesn't mean he, you, you, he just knows ahead of time, right? For the adoption to himself as what? Sons and daughters. See, I'm not, you, 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 the world tries to make it legalistic and foreign. This is not the way it is. A son and a daughter. And I, I've told you before, when I remember President Kennedy and his, his child in, in the Oval Office and through the desk, you know, a little hole in it. That was his dad, the President of the United States. That was his son. But it was a father and son relationship. Yeah, he happened to be the President of the United States, most powerful person in the world at that time. So is our father. He's God. And he calls us what it says, himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of your will? No. This is what he desired all along. His will. He wanted a family. That's what the whole thing was about. He had a family of the angelic that worshipped and praised and carried on the administration of the kingdom of heaven. He wanted another family on earth, a human family, a family that could reproduce. When you reproduce, you create male and female, male and female. You reproduce and create an eternal soul. Angels cannot do that. They were not given unto that. Jesus said they're not given in marriage. There were some that violated that, but that's another story. Okay, verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> it's his will. It's in Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Jesus Christ. That's who his beloved is. Okay? See where I'm at. <laughs> So I'm, um, okay, I'm moving through. <laughs> I hope you understand. He called you. He loved you before the foundations of the world. Loves you today. There is nothing you're going to do that's going to stop him from loving you. And I've heard that silly thing that if he knew me now, he wouldn't have chose me. Yes, he would have. Every time he knew back then what you were going to do today. He is all-knowing. He knows Whatever thing you did that the evil one keeps trying to bring to your remember, if you have sincerely, genuinely repented, ask God to forgive you and the power of the Holy Spirit to turn away from that thing. How many times did Jesus say, Peter was magnanimous and said, Lord, if the person comes to me seven times a day, not with different offenses, with the same offense. So Peter being magnanimous said, what if he came to me seven times? And Jesus said, hey, let me give you some math lessons, uh, Peter. Not seven, but seven times 70, right? 490 is a term for it doesn't matter how many times. That's the heart, 1 Corinthians 13, of Jesus Christ, of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you see friends. John 11, 9 through 14. Jesus answered, and just to give you an example, are there 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see the world's light. Verse 10. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble. Night meaning in ignorance uh, of the word of God. Uh, when you fall into sin, he gives them over to abominations and turns them over to the lust of their heart. Uh, when they are in nighttime, they stumble in ignorance. They stumble, for they have no light. Light is the word of God, the truth of Jesus Christ. After he said this, he went on to them to tell them to give an example of friendship. It wasn't only the disciples, so I'm showing you friendship of Jesus Christ. Because people say, well, gee, he had, the disciples were his friends. You can't be his friend. <laughs> you know what? Your opinion doesn't change me. I, I he said, whatever people think of the visions or the times I spend with you and things I do, it doesn't change what their opinion is because you experience it. So forget what they, Jesus can't, you know what, when you have that idea that Jesus can't do that, he won't do it with you because you're already upset in your mind, unbelief and negative. I don't, he can do whatever he wants. And I welcome 
his screening process, listen to me carefully, I have asked him years and years, Lord, the only voice, you said your sheep hear your voice, I want to know is you. I do not want to hear the sinful nature, which is your own natural voice that oftentimes accuses you or tries to lead you into sin. That's the carnal nature, right? We have that battle within us, the arena, right? Then we have that one that comes as an angel light that tries to, he's just a deceiver, tries to come and imitate the voice of God or imitate the voice of your mother or your father or someone. He's a liar. And until we know and are attuned to that voice, I, I don't know how far I get today. I'm just today sharing. I, I'm amazed at when I see on these National Geographic, like penguins and birds, there they can be like hundreds of thousands of them, and they're all a squawking, but that mother can go and find their own chick. It's, I'm like, how in the world did they do that? Penguins and all these others flying around, and yet they know that one chick's voice. That's the way moms are. Uh, you, you go to a mall or go somewhere, they know their, their child's, their kid's voice. Our father said, you will know my voice. My sheep know my voice. They will not follow another. You ask him, said, you promised this to me. So I'm asking you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be my screening agent. I do not want to entertain uh, false words. Uh, a lot of times prophets and prophetesses will prophesy out of their human spirit in good efforts and good intentions, desires, but it's not the spirit of God. So you also have to ask him to filter that out. Say, Lord, when is it me that uh, is emotionally wanting to give a word of encouragement? Or uh, And usually you can tell those when they start out with a whining, crying voice. I, <laughs> sorry, that's just, when they start that out, um, Jesus, well, prophets, be careful that your own heart and good intentions and desires does not try to overflow and give a prophetic word, not only privately, but also publicly. So ask him, Lord, I want to know your voice and your voice only. And I want it. And it comes with discerning and over time, and then you'll know his voice. Okay. So this is Jesus. Oh, how on that one? Anyone walks in daylight, they'll stumble. His person walks in light. They'll say, after he said this, he went to them to tell our friend. There's that word again, friend. The Greek 5384. Our friend Lazarus. He's not only my friend, as Jesus spoke, but the disciples. He's our friend. Has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And this is... <laughs> until they finally got to know him very well. So verse 12, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better, thinking, you know, if the guy's feeling bad, Lord, won't you let him sleep? Uh, if he's sick, sleep is a good thing. <laughs> they told my bride, be on bed rest four to six weeks, and she's up writing those notes and putting them wax, and <laughs> she loves you. Um, Told him I'm going to take a picture and send it to a doctor. His disciples were like, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get better. And Jesus has been speaking of his death. But the disciples thought he meant he was naturally asleep. This is Jesus. I, I love him. He said, so, verse 14. So then he told them plainly, uh, listen, fellas, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to see him. He had a reason. I've told you that the, the culture of uh, Judaism is that the, the spirit hovers around the body for three days, and then the fourth day it's gone. Jesus knew that. He knew the culture. He knew the customs. So he waited. John 11, 32 through 36. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, and I understand, um, the heartbroken and, and wondering, why isn't he coming? He's our friend. He comes here. We feed him. He relaxes with his. They were friends. That's a place he would love to go and and stay and teach. And Mary would always pop herself right at his feet. Remember, Martha would be running all around. Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. And that's probably true. 
not probably eight. He went to Peter's house. Remember Peter's house? And he said, uh, Peter came and said, uh, Lord, my mother-in-law is in the back and she has fever. You think you could go back there and do something? Went back there and immediately healed her. And that good Jewish mom, what'd she do? She got him started making him food. <laughs> if he had been there. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews who had come with her also sobbing, he was deeply moved in spirit. Okay, he was deeply moved in spirit, the Ruach, to the point of anger at the sorrow caused by death. I wanted you to understand that, right? That's why I put in brackets. He was deeply moved in spirit. What was he moved with? He was angry. If you look at the original text, he was angry, not at their crying and weeping. He understood that because he's, he understands sorrow but the sorrow caused by death because he knows there will come a day there will be no more death. There will be no sorrow. There will be no more tears. I'm, we, You and I, I mean, we're looking forward to that day. All the tears are in the bottom. And he was troubled. And I'll break that down for you. 34. And said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Here's the part I want you to see. Verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him as a close friend. They knew that, G that Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were close friends with the Messiah, with Jesus. Okay? We are offered and welcomed by him to be his friend. You must first follow, know, and acknowledge him. And then as we grow and love and understand him and appreciate to be his, his uh, <laughs> younger brother, joint heirs with Jesus Christ is what the word said. Okay. So let's, I'll break these few, few words down for you. Groaned is the Greek 1690. Uh, listen to this, to snort with anger. But in the case in the Greek, with the utmost thrust of respect, right? So he's groaning inside because he's angry. You say, what is he angry at? They're unbelief? No. He's angry at what death has caused, okay? And he, the whole area, the respect that he had on what was taking place. In spirit, remember I told you? Greek 4151. The Puma, you can see it on there, but P-N-E-U-M-A is the proper word, right, in Greek. And you, uh, when you see it in parentheses, how to, how to uh, pronounce it. It's used to denote the seat, the locality where one does or suffers something like our spirit groans. It's the soul. I've told you that, the soul, right? Mind, will, and emotions shown forth in the tabernacle of Moses. You go into the right, the table of shoe bread. To the left is the menorah, right? Spirit, uh, light, intel, mind. And then the emotions is the altar of incense, the golden altar of incense. Everything in the holy place was gold. Outside, it was brass, meaning judgment outside, inside, it was gold. And he was troubled, Greek 5015, to cause one inward commotion, to take away his calmness of mind. This is Jesus. Remember, I just said he was troubled. This is, I broke it down for you. Uh, 5015, take away his calmness of mind, <laughs> disturb his equanimity, E-Q-U-A-N-I-M-I-T-Y, for those who know how to pronounce real well, to disquiet, to make restless, render anxious or distress to perplex. He was angry at death, right? Death snatched his friend, but it was also, he was there to show the glory of God after you know, the four days, right? And I'll break, look, it says in John 12, 28 through 33. Now is my soul troubled. There's a word troubled, 5015. And what shall I say? Where is he troubled? Keep this in mind, please. Now is my soul troubled. 
It's Jesus. 5015. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. 29. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me. I know his voice. That's my father. But this voice came for you. right? Because of me, but for your sake. Verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, one that was called Lucifer, that is referred to now as Satan or the dragon or the serpent of old, this, the prince of this world, be cast out. Verse 32. Now, going back to what happened with Moses in the Old Testament. If, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, right? Talking about the cross, will draw all men unto me. This he says, signifying what death he should die. So in John 12, he calls and says, my I know what I'm facing. My soul is troubled, right? And his father said, you're my son. I will glorify your name. And then he indicates what type of death, if I be lifted up. That's what he had told Nicodemus, remember in John 3. Referring back, we didn't understand all throughout the Old Testament what in the world the thing was with Moses when he put that brass serpent up. They were not supposed to make any type of replica of anything like that, much less raise it up on a pole. And if a viper, poison viper, bit you and you looked upon that brass serpent, you'd be healed. All throughout the Old Testament, there was no clue like what in the world is that about? Jesus cleared it up with Nicodemus. And then again, he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The sin that has bitten you, the venomous sin, right? If you look to me, you'll be healed. Same way in the Old Testament. When they looked unto that brass, brass serpent, when they were bitten by venomous snakes and they would die, they were healed. And Jesus is saying the same thing. You're, you've been bitten by the sin, right? The venomous sin, you'll die, but I've made a way for you. Okay? Here we go. Mm. Acts 10, 22 through 26. The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Right? So these men of Cornelius' house, a God-fearing man, he was not Jew, but he treated the Jews very well. So it says that the centurion, a Roman centurion, very high rank. So he sent for, this angel came and said, send for Peter, right? An angel appeared to him. A holy angel told him to ask to come to his house so that he could hear. So he says, Peter, an angel appeared to him. He wants you, a Jew, that does not want to associate with Gentiles who is looking at the ministry of Paul circumspect, like doubting that he really is called to uh, the Gentiles. Watch out, Peter. You're about to get a lesson. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. Say, guys, come on in. Uh oh, he's inviting Gentiles to come in. That's not good for a Jew. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers, Jewish believers, right, from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends, okay? Close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I am only a man myself. So the two things, 
So here you have Cornelius with his family and those that were very close with his family friends, okay? And here you had a lesson for the Jew, Peter, that wasn't sure about Gentiles. He had his chance by Jehovah Sneaky. You had to go and learn it firsthand. You went to a Roman centurion's house and the entire household was not only saved, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? <laughs> Jehovah Sneaky. He has a sense of humor. Okay, so James and John, let's look at this one. Get this over there. James and John, sons of thunder. What has this got to do with? Well, let's see. A Jewish mother's request, a good Jewish mother, okay? <laughs> Don't you love your mothers? Let's be these Jewish mothers. Um, sister of Mary, okay? A Jewish mother, uh, Salome. Uh, you'll see Zebedee's wife, Salome. She was the mother, James and John, but also the sister of Mary, so relationships. Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Then the mother, Matthew 27, 56, Salome, that gives her name, Matthew 27, 56. So the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus, to him, <laughs> with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Now, she's a good Jewish mother, took her two boys with her, and knelt before <laughs> the master. <laughs> this is his aunt, right? Verse 21. He said to her, what do you want? He knew what she wanted. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. He said, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Verse 22, Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup? Today we're talking about a cup. That I am able to drink? They said unto him, not only her. <coughs> <coughs> See, each time I go to teach this stuff. I don't cough and can tell you any other time. My nose doesn't run. Sometimes I have a hard time breathing. It's when I do these. <clears throat> they said unto him, we are able. Verse 23. He said to them, you drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand. <coughs> if you're able to sit at my <clears throat> sit in my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. Mm -hmm. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. Verse 24. When they heard it, the other 10, right? I'll go to this one. It says, you do not want you, what you're asking. You're able to drink of the cup that I'm able to drink. They said, and we're able. Verse 23, he said to them, you will drink my cup, but it is to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. <clears throat> Verse 24, and when the 10 heard it, the other guys, right, the disciples, they were indignant at the two brothers, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. <clears throat> it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Boy, here's a lesson in humility. And whoever would be first among you must be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life 
as a ransom for many. <clears throat> the others did not understand what Jesus was saying. He then turned to his other disciples who were angered by James and John's request because they themselves desired the same prime placement at Jesus' right hand. But Jesus clearly states their future as well as true followers, you and me, through millennia. Greatness in the kingdom of God is obtained along the path of love, the path of sacrifice, service, and suffering. Okay? So we have talked about friendship. We're talking about the cup. Now the cup. Because a good Jewish mother came and said, Oh, my two boys are sit in prime positions. <clears throat> so James and John say to Jesus, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. They want a couple of prime cabinet posts in the Messianic administration of Jesus, sitting in the seats closest to the very region of God. Nothing would make them happier than having people look up at Jesus and his dream team, marveling at how great they are. Jesus addresses in the Gospel of Matthew, you do not know what you're asking, says Jesus to the aspiring great ones, James and John, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Jesus senses that they are confused about what they are getting into. And he makes clear that the path of glory goes straight through the wilderness of suffering. Are you listening? Those who want to be first, those who want to go sit at the front of the banquet, Remember, Jesus said, you might get a tap on the shoulder and tell you, you need to go to the back. Whereas if you're sitting in the back, somebody might come tap you on the shoulder and say, you need to go to the front. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, asked Jesus? The cup of my blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? The baptism of dying and rising, one in which suffering and death always precede joy and new life. It's strange in this kingdom of God, in order to live, you got to die. In order to receive, you have to give. You have to sow to reap. In order to be the highest, you want to seek to be the lowest. The greatest, you need to go wash the feet of the disciples. John and James reply, we're able. The two come across as supremely confident, but you have to suspect that they don't know what they're talking about. Me and most of us, when we start out, we have no idea. They're still confused about the path that lies ahead. Jesus doesn't shoot them down. That's him. He loves, he understands. Instead, he nods in agreement. <clears throat> the cup that I drink, you will drink. He promises. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. It's not only James and John, it's you. Those that are in Christ. I love Luke with all my heart, but I know that he has his stuff to go through. My beautiful bride. <laughs> So many things she's had to go, difficulties, hardships, and this latest one. The cup that I drink, you will drink, he promises. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. He knows they are walking the way of the cross, which will lead to suffering for all and to death for some. <clears throat> As for the positions of honor, Jesus said to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. Jesus can promise suffering, death, and new life to all who follow him in faith. But the granting of special places in the kingdom of heaven, that's God's call. 
because God the Father is in control. I love the Sons of Thunder. These guys are characters. James and John both suffered, drank of the cup. James was martyred, beheaded by Herod, Jerusalem. <clears throat> John underwent brutal persecution at the hands of the Romans. It is in Jewish lore that they poisoned him and it didn't kill him. Tried to boil him in oil one time and it didn't work. These are just Jewish culture le legends. And you and I both know he went to the Isle of Patmos at age 90. So the cup of wrath, we covered the mom's request. Let's cover this. The cup of wrath. Make sure I don't skip. <clears throat> the cup of wrath. I had a vision. And there's a cup like that. Remember that cup, and if, in the end, if I share it, I share it. It was very personal. I don't think I would ever share it. I shared it, parts of it with Kimberly and Luke. We'll see. The cup of the Lord's wrath. So what is that? <clears throat> the cup that Jesus is talking about. The cup that he would have to drink, right? Psalm 75, 8. From the hand of the Lord, there's a cup with foaming wine well mixed and he pours it he pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs this cup is for the wicked foaming wine well mixed the sinful the unrighteous the perverted the abomination the abominable jeremiah 25 15 through 18. <clears throat> Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of wine, of the wine of wrath. Make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Verse 16, They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. The cup of wrath is a precursor of death. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. There's a prophetic act. Did he go to all those nations? No, it was a prophetic act. <clears throat> Verse 18, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, his kings and officials, to make them a desolation and a waste, a hissing and a curse as at this day. Jeremiah prophesied about this cup. Isaiah 51, 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up. O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, not the hand of Lucifer, not the hand of Satan, but who? From the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering mentioned several times about the staggering and crazed because of this cup of wrath, right? <clears throat> Ezekiel, you have gone the way of your sister. Therefore, I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord. This is Ezekiel 23, 31 through 35. You shall drink your sister's cup that is deep and large. You shall be laughed at and held in derision. It will also cause people to mock you, hold you in derision, for it contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow. Right? Sorrow, drunkenness, terror. A cup of horror and desolation. Just some of the ingredients in the cup. 
a cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria, the, the northern, that uh, went in. Uh, remember, in Dan and Ephraim, they had set up the calves and, and went into idolatry. Verse 34, you shall drink it and drain it out and gnaw its shards and tear your breast for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. I'm talking about the cup of wrath. Verse 35. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me, a sinful person, and cast me behind your back, you yourself must bear the consequences of your lewdness and your whoring. Look at Habakkuk 2.16. Okay. What about Revelation? Revelation 14, 9 through 10. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand. Let me say this. There are those that said, you know what? We're going to take the mark so that we can still, you know, be in the marketplace and have health insurance and, Oh, by the way, the mortgage on your home, uh, you're going to have to be able to pay for that uh, through the uh, currency of the mark of the beast, right? So if you don't, you lose your home. So you have to understand what that entails. Not only the mortgage on your home, any financial transaction, medical, uh, food, uh, taxi, do you want to buy a car? All that requires the currency that will be under the Antichrist and you need to take the mark. If you do not take that mark, you won't be able to do that. So there are some who are saying, you know what, we'll take the mark, but we're really not going to be worshiping the beast. Let me tell you something. It doesn't work like that. I hope this year soon that he is going to let me talk about exactly what the mark of the beast is and what it represents and why so many people will want it. You won't have to push people to get it. They will be lined up to get it. Okay. If anyone worships the beast and his image receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, it changes you. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength in the cup of his anger. There it is. And he or she will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You can also look at Revelation 16.10. That word sulfur is interesting. If you ever deal, and I dealt with it for years, in exorcism and you deal with the demonic, right? There is... I would almost say always, and I don't like using the word always, but I don't think I have ever not had that smell. There is a smell of sulfur. Sometimes it's a slight odor, and other times it is overwhelming. Uh, the stronger the person is possessed, uh, the, the evil spirit, or the number of evil spirits, the more pungent is that smell along with other things but it's interesting that sulfur in scripture is always associated with evil spirits and uh, dark angels black magic and all those things but when you are dealing with that in exorcism or if you're not and someone is around you and you smell that sulfur smell you'll know <clears throat> The skull. <coughs> there at Golgotha, <clears throat> our Messiah drained the cup of foaming wine filled with God's burning anger down to the dregs. Did you see what we just covered in all of those scriptures? This is the cup he had to drink of. God poured out his wrath full strength. No mercy, no compassion onto his only begotten son. Paul summarized the meaning 
of his world-changing sacrifice. We don't get it. And it's not something that you can comprehend unless the Holy Spirit by revelation or unless someone precisely breaks it down in the teaching. <clears throat> For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin, he who never sinned, pure light, pure righteousness, was made the dark ink of evil, the darkest he became sin. He didn't sin, he became sin. <clears throat> Look at the Amplified. For he, God the Father, made Christ who knew no sin to judicially be sin on our behalf, judicially in the high court of heaven, he was made with the court in session to be sin. You remember heaven was silent for 30 minutes. So that in him, we, you and I, would become the righteousness of God, Jehovah the Father. That is, we, you and I, would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. Okay? He who knew no sin became sin. So let me <clears throat> share from Charles John Ellicott, a distinguished English Christian theologian, academic, and churchman. <clears throat> this is, the four is omitted in many of the best Greek translations, but there is clearly a sequence of thoughts such as it is expressed, right? It expresses this way. The Greek order of the word is more emphatic him that knew no sin, he made sin for us. The words are, in the first instance, an assertion of the absolute sinless, sinlessness, sinless nature of Christ. All other men had an experience of his power gained by yielding to it. He, Jesus alone, gained this experience by resisting it and yet then suffering its effects, okay? None could convict him of sin. John eight forty six. The prince of this world had nothing in him. John fourteen thirty. Please write these down. I know my Bereans do and go back and study. You can compare Hebrews 7, 26 and 1 Peter 2, 24. And then there comes what we may call the paradox of redemption. This is Charles. He, God made the sinless one to be sin. The word cannot mean, as has been said, sometimes a sin offering. As the lambs in the Old Testament, they were a foreshadow of him to come but it's not the same thing. That meaning is foreign to the New Testament, meaning Christ, because there was no sin offer. <clears throat> in Christ until his death. And it is questionable whether it is found in the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus 5.9, being the nearest approach to it. The train of thought is that God dealt with Christ, not as though he were a sinner like other men, but as though he were sin itself, absolutely identified with it. In Galatians 3.13, he speaks of Christ as made a curse for us. 
Also remember, anyone who was on a tree is cursed, crucified on a tree. And in Romans 8, 3, as being made in the likeness of sinful flesh. I'm trying to show you what the cup entailed. Not sin like regular, a sinless, spotless, without blemish, became sin. <clears throat> that's the gentleman and that's the part I just read to you <laughs> so look at those if you just t take a snapshot of it or go back none could I had my papers I'm sorry John 8 43 John 14 30 but it shows that Satan had no hold on him. He had no doorway. He had nothing on him. Only way he could do is submitting to God the Father and to drink of that cup. Okay? From the island of Patmos, John wrote what he visibly observed. And I want to show you in Revelation what it shows. This is important. Revelation chapter 5 is where the um, firstborn, right? You have to, of the firstborn, but you also have to have a kinsman redeemer, as I taught in Ruth. Kinsman redeemer has all the qualifications that I taught. First of all, has to be a relative, has to be capable of doing it, has to be willing to do it. He has to be human, right? Adam was the first, the first Adam, Jesus being human was the second Adam. One was flesh, the other brought spiritual life. Flesh, death, spiritual life, okay? So Revelation 5, 4, this is where he was qualified to take the scroll from his father. Revelation 5, 4 through 7. And I began to weep because he did not think there was a human available that was sinless that could take the scroll. He understood John being Jewish, knowing, uh, being a kinsman redeemer and the right of the firstborn, what had to take place. So he was weeping. Actually, in the Greek, it says he was convulsing. He was weeping so hard. And I began to convulse violently because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Okay. Verse five. Then one of the 24 elders 24 elders, these are those that represent the ecclesia, not the council of God in the Old Testament, okay, that we've covered, the council of God. This is the 24 elders represented the ecclesia because they sing a new song, and these 24 say, you redeemed us by your blood. No angel has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was for humans. So a human sacrifice, spotless without blemish, made sin, became our propitiation, our substitute. Okay? So then one of the 24, representing the ecclesia, you and I, elder said to me, stop weeping. John was taken up into heaven, and in heaven he saw the 24 elders because once he's in heaven, he is outside the realm of time. Where John is, past, present, and future, he could see it all from the vantage point of being in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ so he can see into the future. So he saw this with his eyes, okay? He saw prophecy before it happened. Stop weeping. Look closely. The lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has overcome and conquered talking about Jesus Christ. He can open the scroll and break its seven seals, verse six. And there between, between the two, right? There was God and there was Jesus Christ. So fully, it's standing between them, representing God, fully God, and man is Jesus Christ. Representing God and man. Remember Job had praise him. I, I, I would like to have a judge that could be equal with God and be equal with the man. Well, he's got him in Jesus Christ. So standing in Revelation 5 between God the Father, God the Son is the Lamb. 
the human person, fully God, fully man, so he's able to represent both and stand in between. And there between fully man, fully God, the throne with the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, Christ Jesus, standing, bearing scars and wounds as though it had been slain with seven horns, representing complete power. Seven is the number for perfection. Seven eyes, number of perfection, complete knowledge, all seen. Okay. Which are the seven spirits of God who have been sent on duty into all the earth. And he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay. That's the scene in heaven of Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain. This lamb who partook of the cup. So I'm showing it to you in the cup of Jesus will involve suffering to be sure. Yet the cup of suffering does not quite get what Jesus meant when he referred to a cup. If we look into the Old Testament, we find that the metaphor of the cup stands for our lives, which can be filled with a variety of things. Our cup can be filled with blessings and salvation. You can see it on the screen. Psalms 22, 5. Psalms 116, 13. Okay. Or it can be filled with wrath and horror. We covered a few of those. Isaiah 51, 17. And Ezekiel 23, 33. Frequently the cup stands for God's judgment and wrath. Consider, for example, Isaiah 51, 17. We saw that. Wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You have drunk the cup of terror, tipping out its last drops. Many other Old Testament passages use the metaphor of the cup as a reference to God's fierce judgment. Thus, when Jesus prays about avoiding the cup, he is alluding to these images from the scriptures. He knows them. He's the word of God. By going to the cross, he will drink the cup of God's wrath, his father's wrath, all the way to the bottom. He will bear divine judgment. That which rightly falls upon Israel and indeed upon all humanity, you and me. In this process, he will suffer horribly, both in the physical realm and especially in the spiritual realm as he enters the hell of separation from his father. You remember I told you it's always more real in the spirit than it is in the physical. The spirit before the physical, right? I think what I'm going to do is share the vision, pick up with this next week, and knowing that my bride and Luke and all of you can be prepared for communion. Read Matthew 26, 36 through 46, and you can see it in other translations as well, of Jesus in the garden. I'm going to share the vision, parts of it, limited, but also want you to go and read and be prepared for next week and review this. This, going through all that we have, this was for you. This was for our family. When I say you, it means all of us, us, together. I'm never up here, and it, that it's always us in a little circle together. For years, when I started out, probably after the first five years, it was after that, hard times, difficult times, and then messing up and not getting it right and just growing, you know, just that process of sanctification. I began to think, Lord, you know, if it really came down to it, I see you 
offering yourself for the world and other people. But if it came to me, I, I, I don't think you would have. I mean, I don't think one-on-one -on -one you would have given your life for me. I don't know if I, I don't, I never verbally said that, but in my time with him, there are, in the time spent many times, verbally he speaks to me. For years now, we just, I, I know what he says to me and he know we don't, I don't have to verbally talk. There are times I, don't, I miss his voice hearing it, but I know, but I don't think I verbally said that. He knows everything you're thinking. And for years, I thought that. Just, you know, I bet if it's up to me, just me, yeah, he would have done it. I can see him doing it for Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, um, these other people. I can see him do it for Kimberly and Luke. That's not the way I thought years ago, but I thought... When we were leasing at the other house, this wasn't that long ago. I wrote it in the book. He remembered all those years. Sometimes when he teaches me, it's days. Sometimes it's weeks. And many times it's years. Same thing with prophecy. Something he may have told me years ago. Some still haven't come to pass. Others, it took years uh, to be fulfilled. <clears throat> so this was maybe 30 years ago during that process. And I would think it off and on that I'd do some dumb thing, <clears throat> not some horrible, but just something. And I think that. So the vision, he usually tells me I want to show you something or I'm going to take you somewhere or something. And then other times in my private, it just starts. Most of the time he's with me. And other times I'm in the vision with him. And I think of that time and off of New Orleans off of those back alleys where I saw that drunk and he and I were standing together and I was able to talk to him in the vision and see the vision happen. And as visions are, 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 are a lot like that. Um, this one opened up just like this. It was, I knew when you are in the spirit, all the senses you can't even measure them. Taste, smell, sight, aromas, fragrances. There's a fragrance about Jesus. Uh, it's not cologne. It's not. It's not like a particular flower. It's just a. I don't know what to call it. It's. I, I know it. It's like a. Maybe a honey. It's it's a different fragrance. I don't know that I've ever smelt frankincense in the natural, so I don't know if it's... That wasn't there that night. It was dreary. It was dark. And I could tell he was... This was my vision. I am not telling you he took me back to when he was actually in the garden. I don't know. I just know what I saw. And I asked many times not to share this, but it's, I listened to him. I could tell he was like, his hair was not like, I know what his hair looks like. His hair was not normal. His hair was, he was in anguish. I could sense it. And I heard him crying out, if this is at all possible, please let this cup pass from me. 
but not what I want, what you want. It wasn't matched up with the King James. It was so that I could understand it. And I watched this. And in my vision, I was horrified. And I was, you say, scared. I felt overwhelmed. I felt, you say, wait, well, he doesn't give you the spirit of fear, but I just felt, I felt everything. And I don't know how to describe it. And I started, I remember this, this ain't right. This ain't right. I, something ain't right. It was the first time. I don't know how long this lasted. The second time. It wasn't right away. He, he, he down, like bowing on the ground, then he would lift up his head. <clears throat> That's the same thing. If this is at all, it wasn't his voice. I know his voice. It was strained. It was stressed. It was everything in me started just because I love him. And I, to see him like this, everything in me fell apart. Everything in the vision was no, 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 no. That was the second time. I fell apart in the vision. When he was saying that the third time, I was screaming, yeah, no, 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 I ain't worth it. Don't do this. Don't do it for me. Don't stop, stop, stop. And I remember... <clears throat> Just everything in me said, no, stop this. I don't want to see this. I know I'm not worth this. A cup appeared. Not in his hand, but a cup. And the cup tilted towards me. And I could see the cup. It wasn't no big. It was a cup. It like more on my bowl, but it was shaped. It looked like it was just a, it wasn't ornate. It was a plain, simple, clay-looking thing. And it was, it wasn't smoking. It wasn't green. It was some type of stuff in it. And I'm still screaming. I'm looking at the cup, and he's over there, and I see in my prayer him look at me in the vision. And while I'm crying and telling him no, floating on top, kind of like oil does on the surface of water, is my name, my formal name, Joseph, stock still. In this round thing was my name started floating. He turns back to his father. The thing disappears. He asked him at one time, and now I'm uncontrollably sobbing and realizing what he meant. All him years ago, he answered and says, I would do it for you. This is for you. I would. And the vision went away. He didn't come and console, he didn't come and explain. I don't know how long. I couldn't get this thing out of my head. I don't know how much longer it was. I went and wrote some notes. But I thought to myself, I don't need to go write this down, or I'll never forget this one. And I'll never share this with anyone. I don't even know if I want to share it with Luke or Kimberly. This is too bad. Or it's too good. That was the vision. I'll take it up next time from here. But he let me know very clearly. And he's letting you know because he wanted me to share this that I didn't want to. 
even if it was just you. Not me, because I'm nothing. He told me, this applies to every one of you watching. Your name will appear in that cup. It's not because of billions of people he did it. He did it for you. Only you. Because he was saying, if I did it for you, and you consider yourself that unworthy, that useless, that, and you're screaming, asking me to stop, every single human being that I did this for, if they were in this garden that loves me, would feel the same way, and I would still do it all over again. Thank you for your time. I know it's been long. I look forward to the next time we're together. We will continue to pray for peace, safety, and your blessings. I love you in the Lord Jesus Christ.